welcome to episode 26 of PD's Awesome Guest Panel. My guest at this time is a legendary actress. She is an original of the John Waters Dreamlanders. She was the main star of one of his uh, original films, Desperate Living. She is Susan Moe McHenry Lowe. Sue, how are you today? I'm good, Peter. Thank you for, you know, all the accolades and all. You're a sweet guy. Anytime. Um, my, my question, my first question is going to be your typical cliche question, but I do want to ask it though, and that is how did you get started into acting? Like, what was your first, you know, acting role? Uh-huh. Um, was for Yankee Made Hot Dogs. And that was two years before Mondo Trasho. That was the first movie I was in, Mondo Trasho, with John. And I did want to get your uh, memories of, of doing uh, Mondo Trasho. Well... You know, I I met John through a boyfriend, George Figgs, who played Jesus Christ in Multiple Maniacs. He was my boyfriend. And I met John through him, and they had just finished making Eat Your Makeup. That was one of the really early ones. And um, John and I really bonded over the fact that we only listened to rhythm and blues. And he was playing Tina Turner on the thing, and I went, oh, my God, yes. And we became friends through Ike and Tina Turner. But I knew Divine before I knew John. Um, I, the Maryland Institute College of Art, where I was a student as a teenager, uh, had a fashion department. And one of the students in the fashion department took me to a party, a drag queen party. And so I went to this drag queen party and Divine was uh, Elizabeth Taylor as all the other drag queens were Elizabeth Taylor, too. So I had a very fun time, met Divine, and then we were friends. Divine and I were friends, and he also was going steady with a man or living with a man that was a student at the art school. So I, I actually knew Divine before I knew John, but um, I met John through George Figg's 1966 or 7, one of those years. 67. Memories of doing the movie Multiple Maniacs. That's a wonderful movie. Have you seen it um, uh, recolored and so forth? You have? It looks uh, great. No, I've only seen, uh, I've seen the original one, though. Well, this is all cleaned up now, and you can get it on, I guess, somewhere on the internet. Um, it, it, when it came out here in Baltimore, the only thing that was really different was they had to change the music because they couldn't use the rights to the music that he put on for that movie. Um, because it was like, uh, Jerry, G, Jerry Lewis and, um, um, oh, what's his name? No, all those old singers, um, like, um. Well, James Brown, he had a song by James Brown in it. And all these, uh, I'm, I'm stumped. Uh, all these people that were really big in the 60s, soul music, John had in Multiple Maniacs. So this time when they had it re-released re and retouched up, uh, they couldn't use that music, even though that was the original in the original film. But he got... Um, someone to find a band that could play music like that and it was really good it's really good so i i say try to see it it's, it it changed my mind about the favorite my favorite one and i think multiple maniacs is my second favorite besides female trouble love female trouble me too and i do want to actually before we talk about uh memories on doing female trouble how I, you were in a lot of uh dreamlanders john water works how come you weren't in uh pink flamingo Good question. I wasn't in pink flamingos because I was living in Europe and I had a one a, a baby and I lived in Europe for that time. So John called me, uh, or I called him somehow. We connected and he said, uh, "Do you think you could, are you going to come home to do this movie? I'd like you to be in the movie." And I said, "Well, I'm kind of settled in here, John. I was living on the Isle of Man with my first husband, and he's from the Isle of Man and." and very magical place that was it wasn't like i could just get on a plane the next day and go i had a baby you know it um so that's why that's a good question good question peter 
And I, and I, again, I absolutely loved your role. Like as much as I love uh, Desperate Living, I loved your role in Female Trouble because there's so many great lines. You had, may I suggest Mr. Ray's, uh, Mr. Ray's wig shop. And then when the girl refused to pay for the, the uh, hairdo, she said, then give back, then you were like, give back the hairdo. <laughs> I know, that's, that's a great um, scene. Well, that's we, one of my, that's a favorite movie of mine. I love that one. I could watch that one over and over. And you, you were also, um, you were uh, pregnant though, like during that filming, right? Yes. Um, and my baby wasn't on time and he was going to be, John and I had made arrangements that he was going to be the baby Taffy that the vine has in this, um, the alleyway or whatever. And, um, my baby wouldn't come and there was this, the hospital said they were going to, you know, induce the labor. And I, I said, no, you're not. And I came home and I ran around the block and then I went into um, labor, had the baby. And like five days later, we filmed the scene. Uh, the Divine has a babe, has baby Taffy. So that was my son, Ramsey McLean. Cool. <laughs> he gets fan mail now. He gets fan mail and people on Facebook looking for him. <laughs> I know, right? He's Very cool. shocked. Um, uh, memories of working with uh, the late, great David Lockery. Love David Lockery. He was a brilliant, a brilliant comic. I would say that he was a brilliant actor. I mean, of course, I don't think that he could act any different than he really was because he really was like that. And so funny. I mean, he was a true, a truly brilliant comedian. Loved David. And we used to go to nightclubs together. And, you know, it was very sad when he died. Very sad. I see. And uh, working because you worked with her like in many roles, uh, and that is um, MVP, Mary, uh, Mary Vivian Pierce. One of my best girlfriends. She is one of my best girlfriends. I adore her. We always were laughing. We were bad girls together, even after all the movies were over. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we used to have ladies night, right? Oh, we'd tell our husbands, oh, we're just going to the movies or something. And we'd be going right to the bar getting drunk. <laughs> we have these memories. I love. It. We call her Bonnie. Ah, uh, yeah, and her name's Bonnie. Of course, I gotta ask about like working with Mick Stoll. Oh, I love Mink. Mink's one of my best girlfriends too. Uh, Mink is just the most vibrant, most interesting, um, and she helped me a lot uh, do, uh, for Desperate Living. She's really coached me a little bit here and there, and it was very good. Uh, Mink is a, is a sweetheart, really, <laughs> and um, we're very good friends, and she's doing very well right now, so I'm proud of her. Did, did you have a favorite uh, scene that, whether it was your scene or another scene, that you just absolutely loved in Female Troubles? Um, oh, God, I love Divine waking up, looking at, oh, beauty, beauty, look at me. <laughs> When she wakes up with a new face. Beauty, beauty, look at me. You know, and I think that's my favorite scene when she's that deluded, you know. And of course, I love the scene where she kills everybody in the audience. It's a wonderful scene. Oh, yeah. So well, she, she was doing the trampoline scene, right? Yeah, the trampoline scene. I love that. Um, I, but I think that Female Trouble was uh, Divine's um, bridge to real theater. I, in other words, that he had created the character and it was very, very stylized in Female Trouble. And that's what made Divine, I think, Female Trouble. I agree. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's widely, you know, acclaimed like that to uh, many John Waters fans that out of all his three original works, like, you know, that's definitely the one that put Divine uh, on the map. Mm hmm. Uh, would be, of course, Pink Flamingos. Uh, that too. Like they say, it's a tie between Pink Flamingos and Female Troubles because right. the, his just his because uh, the style he did, like he was like this brash, you know, you know, per, agon, like he's like the evil protagonist. Yes. Oh yeah, always. You know, that was his. That's what he developed the character. How he developed developed the character was to be that person that he is in Female Trouble. Oh, I. Um, I. I'm proud to say that I was the first person that that uh, made a movie with John where Divine was not in it, and I I uh, took the place of Divine because the role was written for Divine, not me. 
And I didn't know that until after the movie started. Well, that is that was going to be my next question, too, was that you worked, I mean, originally, Mole McHenry in Desperate Living was supposed to be written for The Vine, but then he had to do a play in London called Women Behind Bars. Right. Um, and, and this was your chance, like, to be like, uh, I mean, this is your chance, like, that, that you were, a, you know, uh, a recurring character. You went from a recurring character in Female Troubles to an, a main character in Desperate Living as Mole right. McHenry. This was a big opportunity for you, and I wanted to get your memories of doing Desperate Living. Well, it's it's fun. It's a good story, and it'll be in my book as well as in your in your YouTube. Um, he called me up and said, come on over and have dinner with me. And I had a feeling that he was going to talk to me about something like for the movie I, because we were getting ready to have, you know, to do the movie. So he said, over and over, he said, Sue, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. Sue, you don't have to if you don't want to. Sue, you know, I understand if you don't want to do it, you know. And I said, John, I, I, I appreciate the challenge and I can't wait, you know. And then he was like, you know, and um, because he thought it was going to ruin my um, my vanity somehow if I did it. He says, I want to make you ugly. He says, Sue, I'm going to make you really ugly. Sue, I'm going to make you the ugliest person in the world. <laughs> so but I said, John, I already said, yes, I can't wait to start. So I, I, what he didn't have to, you know, he didn't have to ask me twice. Let's put it that way. And I remember, like in the other commentary, like uh, I could be wrong on this though, but he said it was very hard to make you that way because you're a very beautiful woman. That was hard to turn you into the hideous Mo McHenry. Now you said that before, and I think that's so sweet that he said that about me because. He he's never said that to me. <laughs> like, um, and I was I was good looking, you know I was okay looking, and it didn't damage my vanity at all. As a matter of fact, I took it on. I think if I was a stupid person, it might have damaged my vanity. But I was very curious to see if I could dig down deep for this character that he's writing this script, you know, for me. So. Um, I couldn't wait. I mean, I couldn't wait to try out this character. And the first scene was the Rassel and Rita scene that we filmed. And I know, right? Because I had to have long hair in that scene. And they hadn't cut and shaved my hair yet. So we had to do that scene first. And I think that's, I think that's one of his best scenes that he ever made. End of conversation. That's when Rassel and Rita is awesome. That's when you stepped on the guy's eye, right? Yeah. Oh, that was a great, I think that's a great what scene. What was that? Pardon? What it was, was jelly on a, jelly on a marble or something. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, yeah, probably something like that. Now, you also got to work with, and I believe this was her first Dreamland, uh, Dreamlander movie, and that was Sharon Neese. What was it like working oh. with Sharon? Well, Sharon and I are best friends. I haven't seen her in a long time lately, but my uh, best friend at that time, my best friend was Cookie Muller. Okay. Yes, yeah, she was my best friend, and we used to laugh ourselves till we peed our pants. We were very creative, though. Cookie and I and Sharon, the three of us, created some very interesting little plays that we used to put on in St. Mark's Square in New York. Um, and we were pretty creative, and we did another show. A, a stage show and then I created a band um, I, I was living with a musician he was not my lover but he was my roommate and he was the most brilliant musician that I'd really ever you know had ever witnessed and he and I started a band and Cookie and Sharon were my backup singers and I wish I had a picture of that right now that I could show you um, uh, but let me see well, let's not waste time, but um, I'll post it on my Facebook page. I'll post a picture of BB Steel Review. That's what we were called. Edie was in our show. It was like a little cabaret show. And we played um, Max's Kansas City. We played Provincetown a lot. They loved us in Provincetown. And um, Edie w played different uh, characters and came out and sang them like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz with her little toy dog. This is Edie Massey, man. And she would come out and sing Over the Rainbow. 
which was a hoot because she was terribly off key, which everybody loved. Everybody loved her. Andy Warhol loved her. Edie Massey. But anyway, yeah, so we, so Cookie, yeah. Cookie was my best girlfriend. She wanted to be famous. She really wanted to be famous in New York, and she did. She went to New York, and she, uh, she was a writer. And her books are fantastic, you guys out there, and very entertaining. Cookie, Cookie had the best sense of humor than anybody that I've ever known. She went to New York and her first um, her, uh, literary works were for the um, the Village Eye, which was a kind of a beatnik slash hippie kind of magazine, like what's going on in the East Village. Um, and she wrote, she had a very funny column called Ask Dr. Muller. And it was um, how to get rid of pimples and, you know, you know, questions like that. And she would come up with something that was totally insane and, and you know, just a joke. Oh. But she became famous and she became a uh, um, uh, great writer. She has a style that is going to, you know, I'm very, um, I'm going to be very, you um, um, inspired by her when I start when I start working really hard on my book. Very cool. So, and Sharon was her lover, and um, Sharon and I started to be. Cookie died early. She had AIDS in the eighties. She, she, um, it was very sad. She, she and her husband had AIDS, and um, I was there when she died, and Sharon was there when she died, and it was Sharon and I that took care of her in the end. Um, and it's just a sad thing. I don't. Th I don't know whether I want to get into it. Maybe it's in her. Maybe it's in the back of her one of her books or something. But we don't have to be sad tonight. I understand. And don't but I miss her. And I. She is the only person that I dream of all the time. That's pretty cool. Absolutely. And I, can I say too that I absolutely loved your vest and tie in uh, Desperate Living, like at the very end. I really loved the the, the three piece uh, suit and tie that you wore. Oh, wasn't that like super super fly? It was, there uh, was, it was there's a uh, story behind that too. Um, John wanted to get get me a super fly outfit, and that one was perfect. So we went to this this men's clothing store, and I forget what it was called. He might have it in shock value, the name of this place. So we went in there, John and I, and the mate and uh, Van Smith, who did all the costumes and, and makeup. Who and he created Van Smith was the one that introduced me to Devon. Anyway, so we went into this shop and they were like, "What the hell?" <laughs> and the people in the shop were like, "What the hell?" And um, so we went and looked through the racks and everything. And John said, "Do you think that?" Uh, you have a suit like this that would fit her and they were laughing at us and we were laughing at ourselves and it was and then we went to the little tavern hamburger place that he always used to love to go to so yeah that was um i, I bet shock value will have the name of um that shop because it was very it was pretty famous in baltimore and they all had all the the the, the new styles for black men it was wonderful very cool. And I got to ask you to um, about like, because the, the uh, because Edie played the uh, Queen Carlotta, who was the main antagonist in the movie. And, you know, like the it's like, it's so good. I mean, it, I, like the way you and her like were acting, though, it came off very real. It came off very believable, like uh, working, good. With, working with uh, Edie in that movie. I'm sorry, would you say the last what, sentence? What was it like working with Edie in that movie? <laughs> Well, I think Edie is brilliant in Desperate Living. I think she is brilliant, but she, um, she um, sometimes would get on her own track of thinking and it would make John angry. And she, when we first started the Desperate Living, she, for some reason, she couldn't say Mortville. She had to say Mortsville. And it was over and over again. And John was getting very frustrated. And he said to her one day, he said, if you say Mortsville one more time, I'm going to your house and I'm going to kill all of your nine kitty cats. She never said Mortsville again. <laughs> he was joking, of course, you know, but yeah. um, she never said Mortsville again. It was Mortsville after that. <laughs> so uh, that's just a funny thing that's going in my book, too, that whole scene. I, I witnessed it. I went, oh, my God, she was so humiliated. But it worked. <laughs> Somehow it worked. 
Uh, memories of working with the late great Jean Hill. I loved her more than I loved myself. I loved Jean Hill. She kept the ball rolling when, you know, sometimes on a set it can be very boring because you're waiting for somebody to do their other set. And she just kept us laughing and kept us going. And she was a very intelligent woman. She had her own theater in um, a very famous nightclub avenue in black neighborhood in Baltimore. And she had her own uh, school. She was a school teacher and she had her own theater where she performed plays and stuff. She was very brilliant. Jean Hill was very brilliant. And she died, what, like two or three years ago, I think. It was very sad. But she had a great life. She was very, very happy. She had a lot of sisters, and her mother was great. And I went to Thanksgiving. To, John and I went to Thanksgiving at her house once, and it was like, there was like 10 turkeys <laughs> to feed us and all of her family. So it was really raucous. It was fun. Oh, I, I just was wonderful. I got to tell you, I got to tell you some really cool fact about it when I get into polyester, but I do want to ask you, I do have a couple more uh, uh, desperate living questions though. Like okay. uh, the lottery ticket that Mo McHenry used, was that an actual lottery ticket or was it uh, something else? You know, I'm sorry, Peter, but I can't really remember. Um, it, it could have been, um, but I really can't remember to say yes or no. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, I just don't remember whether it was real. Probably was real. I would say that it probably was. And, and you, sir, you nailed that role as Mo McHenry because, like, you know, especially um, when, like at the end, and though, like, uh, we're, like you threatened when you go to John, was it John Hopkins you said? Yes, that's where the sex change, brilliant genius, Dr. Money. Yeah. That was his name. He was the the doctor who changed the world for gender changeover. And um, he, he was really famous. He was a friend of mine um, because he collected African art and so did I for a little while. And we became friends through that way. But he was an oddball. I mean, he was a kook. But he was brilliant in that he knew that, um, you know, now it's no deal that a man becomes a woman. I mean, it's no big deal, right? It happens a lot and probably every day around the world somewhere. And then, but then it was, hadn't been studied much and he was controversial. His papers were controversial. And it was his office that we used. Uh, now, uh, did you have, oh, okay. And uh, what were your memories of working um, in uh, working with Divine, though? I, def I wanted to ask you that question. I love Divine so much. You know, when, when you get me to talk like this, I, I really realize that I'm a very loving person, I guess. But I love Divine, and, and he loved me, and, you know, um, we smoked so much pot. Divine. <laughs> Divi smoked so much pot. Oh, my God. It was like I had to go out and look for it all the time, like three times a week because I was I was the go boy for a while. But did that's know, okay because we always had fun, you know. Did you know, Susan, he was actually originally supposed to be um, Uncle Otto in uh, Married with Children? Yes. That's where he passed away. Yeah. Right exactly. before he signed the contract. Um, he just passed away, but what a life, right? I, I, I mean, we're all, it was terribly sad because he was just on the brink of, you know, mainstream and, and we all thought it would be really good for him to sort of break out of the mold a little bit, you know, and, um, and it was just so sad. It was just so sad, you know, I still cry. I, yeah, it was, it was sad when he passed away. Like, um, I think, uh. Hairspray was his last movie, right? Um, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, what what was the movie that was right after that one? Uh, Hairspray. Pecker? Forty-year-old James Weber was shot the same location. Which one was it? Um, Smellovision. Oh, that that's polyester. Okay, so it was polyester right after. No, it was polyester so, uh, was before hairspray. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I think it was his last uh, film. Yeah. 
I, I definitely want to ask you too, like before we get to polyester, uh, polyester questions, um, what was uh, your favorite uh, line uh, as Mole McHenry or your favorite scene as Mole McHenry? Well, you know, I love the, I love Rassel and Rita because she really looks hard and she does look good. But um, my favorite um, quote is ditto doll face when I'm getting up to see who's at the door and it's a bunch of goons at the door. And I get up and I go to the door and I'm saying that to my girlfriend. She says, what are those ugly, uh, what were they called, um, goons? What are they doing at our door? They, I hate them. And I said, ditto doll face. So I even oh. use that line now too. When I, you know, some, when I repeat some, I, I love this the part. It's the same scene too, I think, where like you enter the door and it's one of the goons, and then they give you a newspaper, and you're and you're like, ah, yes, that's the scene. Uh, Did a dog face. <laughs> uh, I like that. Um, the um, I was gonna ask you something else too about uh, desperate living too. Like uh, I'll try to remember it like later on. But with polyester though, you played the foot stoppers victim. What was it like doing polyester? Well, that we're seeing, so it was, you know, it was back to, you know, small parts. Um, I liked how John tweaked it, though, because, you know, in a town like Baltimore or any, you know, proverbial town like this, you're going to have, um, you know, people don't want to get involved if they see somebody shot or getting knifed or anything. They just sort of run away. They don't help you. Um, and that was sort of a pun on that. I was trying to get a pun on that. And then I just get up and walk away. But my legs look good. My legs look good in that shot. <laughs> and uh, I want to tell you a, a fun fact, though, about uh, polyester. Like, Jean Hill, I met, this is what I want to tell you about Jean Hill. She, uh, in one scene, she's biting the tire, like a, a, a tire. She she did succeed in popping the tire, but she bust her tooth when doing it, though. Like, I think oh, my God. Uh, I hope John paid for it. I gotta rewatch the auto commentary on that one. <laughs> but yeah, like, I, I mean, I loved your role. I, I don't even remember that, Peter. I don't remember that, but I believe you. Like, there's that. Um, what was another one too? Like, um, I did want to ask you about Serial Mom because Serial Mom was the one that had Kathleen Turner and mm -hmm. Ricky Lake in it. Uh, memories of doing that movie because I think you were one of the uh, the jurors. Yes. Um, well, I love Kathleen Turner. And she is so big on the screen. She really is, is her personality is so big on the screen. But, um, you know, when I, when I first met her, it was in the makeup room. And um, I, she was very small. She's a little girl. Um, but what a big character she is on the screen. You know, and um, she just, I mean, I was blown away by her charisma. She was she was a tough cookie, but she knew that she was adored by people. So about, John, I think she became one of John's really good friends. How about Ricky Lake? Well, Ricky Lake and I hang out together still. She's one of my best fun buddies. She lives in New York now, and uh, whenever I visit New York, I always call her up with what's going on, da 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 da, and we go out and we have a laugh, a laugh or two. Ricky's wonderful. And for hairspray, when they rushed me to the to the set um, of uh, hairspray, when it was, do you want to answer that or? No, no, it was a text message. It was a text. So, um, John got me a um, a little jet to fly to Reading, Pennsylvania, because he thought that my scene that I was going to have in hairspray was going to be there. Meanwhile, it wasn't, but I got a free vacation, you know, and they had a, a, a trailer with my name on it and a star and everything. I thought, oh, hell yeah, I'm going to stay and have a little vacation right by this pool. And um, Divine and I just smoked pot and laughed. And we used to try to get um, Ricky to smoke pot with us. <laughs> but um, her mother was always like hovering over her. And she was, what, 15 or something? But it's one of the things that she and I laugh about now. But um, Divine, oh, come on. It's only one joint. Come on. Come on. You know. And she, oh, I can't. And um, there was a li little man on that was one of the dancers that had fallen in love with me. I don't know 
why or what what but he fo- he followed he would every night follow me to my trailer and um, I'd have to run and lock the door because he was cute <laughs> I didn't want to go to jail no I'm only joking about that but I had a very fun time on that um, in Reading Pennsylvania um, it was near an old um, um, what do you call it like an old Hershey Park thing you know oh okay yeah uh huh. Uh, what about um, memories of doing Pecker? Because you were the hairstylist in Pecker. Well, I I really don't remember doing Pecker. I mean, I remember the scene I had, but I wasn't on the set. That was the only time I was on the set of that movie, and I don't know why. Probably I was babysitting my grandchildren or something. You know, usually I like to hang around with everybody on the set, even though I don't have much to do. Uh, you know, I like to hang around and be a part of it. Um, so, but I don't remember Pecker, and I don't remember, um, well, I don't remember Pink Flamingos at all because I wasn't there, but when I did see it, I was just thought, I was just saying, yay, go girl, go girl, <laughs> you know. <laughs> what about, uh, memories of doing, uh, Cecil B. Demented? I don't have very memory, very many memories of that movie either, um, I, except he used a scene of mine uh, for the trailer of the movie, and I was I was very honored to to have that. Um, what what did I do in in that movie? You were um, oh yeah, I threw jujubes. Yes. What's her name? <laughs> you were one right. of the family uh, family first protesters, and you were throwing jubilee uh, right. at the. Uh, the crew at a uh, melody. Right. Uh huh. She uses a trip. <laughs> I was gonna say memories uh-huh. of working with her. Uh no, don't. <laughs> <laughs> we can just skip her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I do want to ask you, and I forgot to ask this one too because I really like this uh, this, this actor, um, Paul Swift. Memories of working oh with Paul God. Swift. Paul Swift and I. Well, we lived together. Paul and I were roommates back in the '60s. And this is when um, we were all starting to make the movies. And um, I lived in this, this uh, I lived on the harbor in this little neighborhood that was just, it was so charming. It had nothing in it except old people, um, winos and Greeks. And there was two bars on every block and was on the, right on the water, right on the harbor. And, you know, the, the sailors would come into the harbor and we'd be down there looking at them. And um, anyway, uh, we had, the first time I moved down there, I moved in with a bunch of artists from Maryland Institute. One was Vince Perennio. And he, we had this, this old bakery that, that was wonderful because it was only like $15 a month rent. And we drank at this one bar. And when I saw Edie, who was the barmaid at this bar, um, I called John up and I said, John, you have to get down here. You know, I introduced him to um, Paul Swift, to Edie. I introduced him to a lot of actors. I should send you my catalog with my artwork because um, he talks about me. But anyway, Paul Swift was a wonderful person. He was the kindest, fun- funnest. He was really fun. And he, he had a really odd story. He was, he was in the Navy forever and he could really swim. He had a bit of a speech impediment, and um, he he used to get drunk and get on the on the bar. Well, it didn't matter what bar it is; he just get up on the bar, get drunk, and get up on the bar and do a, a strip tease. He was wonderfully good. He was wonderful. He um, unfortunately got hit on the head um, with a two by four, and he after that his mind wasn't as clear as it was and uh, we were roommates for a long time and very good friends for a very long time I thought he was brilliant in uh, Fink Flamingos he was good me too I loved him as the Eggman great right he's he was a wonderful person I have a soft spot in my heart for him what about um I was going to ask you this too uh I can't forget this uh woman because she was uh you know, a part, a very uh, vital part of Dream Dreamland. As much like you, she was very uh, important, and that is Pat Moran. Love Pat. She's the best. Pat is, is Miss Personality, but and she will tell you right to your face what she thinks of you, right off the bat. 
And I like that kind of honesty. She's very brilliant, and she's been John's right arm for a long time. Cool. She, you know, since he started, I think. She's wonderful. I love her. How about, and I think she was very close with uh, Cookie, uh, she was close with Cookie Mueller and uh, Divine in Female Troubles, and that is Susan Walsh. Susan Walsh. I used to hang out with her, but, you know, she had a family, too, and, you know, I never really hung out with her much alone with her, um, except in the end of her life. She, um, she was very sad at the end of her life. She she had, she was drinking a lot, taking pills, and she died early. She died a couple of years ago. And um, but she was fun and beautiful. I think she is so beautiful. In I guess it's multiple maniacs. Is it multiple maniacs? Anyway, she was one of John's early girlfriends. So um, I have a. You know, you know, I'm never going to say anything bad about anybody when I do an interview. And um, I loved Susan. She was wonderful. And I'm so sad that she was that sad in the end of her life. I see. And now you, you've, uh, you're familiar with Camp John Waters, right? Yeah. Have you ever? Uh, like, uh, sort of. I, uh, not really, though. I mean, oh, you mean this thing that, that Mink and um, Mink and John and um, Catherine, I mean, um, what's Catherine. her name? Yeah, Kathleen Turner. The one that they're going to do? Yeah, like, I, I think it's yeah. the whole COVID thing happened. I think they were supposed to do that. Yeah, um, I think so, too. I knew it was going to be this summer that he, he wanted to do it. Um, I didn't know much about it, really. You know, and, of course, since they didn't do it, I didn't hear anything about it. I just talked to John today, actually. And um, he, I said, well, what the hell are you doing? I mean, you can't be you know, doing your comedy shows and stuff. He says he's writing another book, so good for him. Yeah, I, I, he very yeah. good guy. Like, I had the He never has relaxed once in his life. And I said to him today, I said, I hope you're enjoying a, a few minutes, you know, not just working constantly. He said, oh, no, I am, you know. I went here with this person and went there. So he's, he's, um, he's right. He's good. He's in Baltimore now. He's so cool, though. I got I had the honor of meeting him twice. Uh, I met him once at a book signing in New York, and then I met him again in the city uh, when he did his one-man Christmas show. And the guy doesn't skip a beat. He went on yeah. for 90 minutes straight talking. Nope. I don't think the guy even breathed. I know. I know what you mean. And he paces when he delivers his cracks and jokes. He paces. But you know what? I was... Um, that must be a method, because I know... When I was uh, teaching college, I was teaching art history, and I would do the same thing. I would pace. It would just be a natural thing to pace up and down in front of the classroom. Somehow it makes your your brain, you know, kind of work better. I yes. agree. And I first found out about, like, they asked me, how did you know about John Waters? I first found out about John because I'm a huge fan of The Simpsons. He was on the, an episode of The Simpsons, which is one of my favorites. I and... That's how I, I did research uh, later on, like, and then I started to decide to watch his works. And I, the first movie I ever watched was Pink Flamingo, and then uh, Female Trouble, Desperate Living, and it went on and on. Like, like I am a huge fan of uh, Mr. Waters. Yeah, I see. I know. You, you got a hold of me, didn't you? And I absolutely loved your work in uh, Desperate Living. Like, I mean, you as Mo McHenry was, like, funny. I was like... Everything you said was just freaking funny. Like, it was uh, the one where you're like, listen, man, if you don't give me, like, right now, I'll saw off your Peter and put it on to me. That that was a good scene. I think that I had, by, by that time, I got to know the character I was playing. You know what I mean? Because it did take me a while to get that character where I wanted it. Absolutely. And I think that was, that was um right at that point that you're talking about was when I really realized, okay. Now, I do want to ask, like, that store you went into, like, to cash in the lottery ticket, though, was that, I mean, was that, like, real money or was that, like, prop money? Uh, I, I guess it was real money. I mean, just had real money there, you know. Um, and it was a real place, a liquor store there on downtown, and 
for somebody in that place and um, somebody that he lived in that building. So, uh, but it was not near Johns Hopkins. We we um, filmed that at, uh, apart from each other. Those two scenes. Oh, okay. because the liquor store was not near. Okay, cool. And um, now, uh, Sue, Sue, before we conclude, uh, uh, actually, before we conclude, I just have one question to ask. Like, when you cast in that lottery ticket, where was that located? What was the film's location on that one with that corner store you went to? That was uh, right downtown <clears throat> in a, the neighborhood of Mount Vernon. <clears throat> and it was like a sleazeball liquor store that sold lottery tickets. So it was really, a, you know, it was really real. And it was downtown. Now, the way the film goes is I walk along and then uh, you see me walking up to Johns Hopkins Hospital to yes. Dr. Money's office. And that it, that's in a different, you know, they weren't in the same place. So the liquor store was downtown and Johns Hopkins is sort of East Baltimore. Oh. So, um, you know, but yeah, it, it followed, um, it, two scenes followed each other uh, in the movie. There are two different places so I filmed that scene, once in the liquor store and once at Johns Hopkins. I love that scene in Johns Hopkins. <laughs> Give me your dick and I'll sew it on. Uh, my <laughs> now, uh, now, Sue, before we uh, conclude the interview, though, um, because this is an open forum, it, you could talk about anything, you can endorse or plug anything, like the floor is yours, Sue. Okay, Peter, I want to thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to fans and to talk to you. You're my friend now, remember? Absolutely. To follow the rules, you know, and um, I love y'all. Very cool. And, um, Is that good? Yeah, yeah. I, like, think I, I love I, all my fans. I, I, absolutely. And, um, like there's uh, two, uh, the the group Long Live John Waters are huge fans of you. They idolize you, like like you know. Yeah. And, and my friend Alan uh, Polson, would you be able to shout out like the Long Live John Waters fan page and uh, my friend Alan Polson, like just to say hi to them, like right hey, now. Hey Alan, what you doing? Are you being cool tonight, Alan? You better be, cause your friend is talking to me, and I'm talking to him, and we're talking about you. <laughs> you better be a good boy. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> I, I did. Um, let me just say uh, thank you so much for the interview, though. Like, like it was a total honor and pleasure, though. And again, thank you for. I mean, to, to quote the Golden Girls, "Thank you for being a friend." <laughs> thank you, Sugar Pie. Okay. Okay. You better be my friend and call me up sometimes. Okay. I'm <laughs> Bye. All right, take care.